Okay. Ah, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, we'd have more form factors. So, I mean, more, more of the, not, uh, I mean, the structure functions, the Fs, we'd have other Fs. So we'd have, and the F from, uh, for example, there would be non parity conserving constructions that wouldn't require the spin. And uh, so, I mean, in some sense, the one that we got before uh, here, this one here, just having a W. So the W here plays, so it appears where the photon did in the deep inelastic scattering experiment at Slack. So you go to high energies and the Ws, you start getting charge and uh, exchange. The reason you, you have to go to high energy to see it is because the photon has this advantage. Its propagator is one over Q squared because it's massless. So if Q squared is not too big, then one over Q squared is much larger than one over Q squared minus uh, one over Q squared plus MW squared or minus MW squared. The MW you know, completely dominates the size of the amplitude and in that case and keeps it really small. But when Q squared gets to be of order of MW squared, the two contributions are uh, parametrically the same. So in that case, really, that reflects itself in sensitivity to this W3. A new structure function comes in. Uh, and if QCD itself did not satisfy parity, then that would show up even at the lower scales, in particular, much smaller Q squared. You'd need a W3 than you do in, in real life. But uh, back then, when this all the was still fresh and funky, was there that everybody just assumed that No, people knew by looking at nuclear physics, by looking at decays of nucleons and things like that, and also by analyzing uh, the nature of uh, pion production and, and, you know, kind of lower energy QCD that to a very, very good approximation parity was respected. So it was definitely experimental input. In other words, after 1956, people knew that parity was not respected in uh, the weak interactions, but it really took a specialized uh, uh, look at different experiments to see that. So that was the famous uh, discovery and really surprised everyone. But before, looking at with large amplitudes where you could do lots and lots of uh, experiments, people had real confidence that, it, that parity was respected. And, and what happened was people generalized that from the strong interactions and electromagnetism where you could also see that parity was respected and there with real precision uh, in the atomic spectra and things like that, they said, well, it must be general. You know, it would be unnatural for it to be, but then there it was. Was there another question? Or no, no, no. No, that was it? We're going to. Right. Um, well, just because it's kind of simpler, you know, <laughs> it was leading order in, uh, well, the question is, it's not even obvious. It's leading order in two ways. One is it's leading order in, uh, in quantum electrodynamics. And there, we know that corrections are generically small. I mean, so in, in a technical sense, it means that even for quantities which at the next leading order involve a logarithm, it's really the logarithm of the momentum transfer over the electron mass that comes in. And it's small because alpha, alpha is one over 137. So a log never competes essentially. Um, so that's higher orders are at least in principle understood. 
Then there's the question of leading order uh, in QCD, but we know it's QCD now, then we didn't know it was QCD. We knew it was a theory for which, if you made this assumption that the strong interactions are weak, <laughs> whatever that means, and you could treat the parton as being a free particle in the final state, it's leading order into whatever corrects that. And what corrects that is QCD. And we'll see as we go along what it means to go beyond leading order in QCD that way, okay? So leading order for us will be the parton distributions phi of X where there's no other dependence. They're universal. They don't depend on the momentum transfer, anything like that, okay? So we'll come back to that and, and make, you know, Make sure you're satisfied that you, you see how those comments relate to what happens next. Anything else? Yes. Oh, the chiral anomaly. Um, it's <laughs> not, um, let me just think for, for just a second. Um, no, I, I I shouldn't say no, because uh, it's related to all this, in particular the W three, and in trying to understand better that that structure function, one needs to understand uh, what's going on with the chiral anomaly. Okay, what's the chiral anomaly <laughs> for those who uh, you know here? It's like the remember the electromagnetic current is conserved, d mu j mu equals zero, and that means in particular that the unphysical polarization of real live photons, who's where the polarization proportional to the momentum, is very important that that polarization decouple. Because if that doesn't decouple, you've lost track of the number of degrees of freedom and you can't do anything with your theory. You're just completely at, at a loss. In, so then that's, that's the case for the electromagnetic um, current, which is psi bar gamma mu psi, where psi is an electron, or it could be quark for that matter, if it's the electromagnetic current. But if you do psi bar gamma mu gamma five psi, Okay, you put the gamma five in there, something that's actually tends to mix the way the left and right-handed components of the, of, the, of the fermion interact. Then you get a, a new set of currents and you can ask, are they conserved or are they not? And the fact is in the standard model because of quantum effects, a one loop quantum effect, it is not conserved, but you actually know more about <laughs> what uh, what makes it not conserved, but what so this d mu j mu five on the right hand side instead of zero, what you oddly enough get is a pion field, and so the non conservation of this object has to do with a very important physical effect, which is the decay of the neutral pion, and you get amazing uh, predictions out of that. Um, its occurrence here is somewhat, it's, it's buried deep in all this, in, in what in particular W3 would be, but in a, uh, in a somewhat indirect way. And in fact, I maybe, okay, I, I don't wanna try and go too far, but here, I didn't emphasize this last time, which is that this G1, okay, that multiplies uh, the parity non-conserving piece here, in the presence of a uh, of a photon spin, actually, whether parity is conserved or not doesn't matter. This is even for photons. Um, this G one is proportional not to the normal parton distributions, which sum over the spins of the possible spins of your parton, the observed parton, but on these non on these uh, uh, so called helicity uh, dependent distributions, delta phi, which is phi plus minus phi minus. And these are the two uh, left and right helicities of the parton. It distinguishes between the left and the right because the, the gamma phi mixes the two in a way that gamma mu by itself doesn't. And so in where the, the chiral anomaly that 
Bono is referring to comes in in particular is, and when you take the integral of, of uh, G1 in particular, then the value of the integral dx of G1 of x is related to this anomaly. It's related to its size, in fact. And there are predictions about it. And people went out to try to, this was where I mentioned that where there was a thing called the spin crisis, which is kind of flaying out even to the day we speak. Um, it was that particular, the value of this integral of G1, which tells you in a sense, how much is a plus solicity and how much is a minus solicity. For a spin, if the spin were entirely due to the quarks, the integral of G1 would be like one, but it was much less than that. In fact, at the time it was compatible with zero. And all of that part of what plays out there is this chiral anomaly, the, the role of the pion field itself in determining this in this indirect way, the spin of protons. So it ties things together. And I'm not sure I can do better than that. <laughs> but it is, it is connected here through these distributions, which appear in the structure functions with uh, polarized uh, uh, protons and, uh, and, and in principle, uh, photons. Okay. Was there, yes, one more. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is success. I'm totally like happy. <laughs> So what about the, what about the, if uh, momentum transfer is uh, like one electron interacted with uh, one proton and that proton before coming out of the proton, it interacted with uh, another. Uh-huh. So where this is, it's, 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 that's, well, they're gone. Uh, it's those final state interactions. And so, right, because, I mean, I shouldn't say right. I mean, <laughs> so we had a picture where the parton, absorbs the photon, then it has many friends, and then it comes out. Maybe it comes out like this. Okay, we'll have it here. So you say, well, what about when it, does this, right? I mean, it, it could scatter again. So the two things involved with that. One of them is that this is a hard scattering of, in other words, the virtuality here, the momentum transfer here is comparable to the momentum transfer here. Then the cross section will be suppressed just by the fact that hard scattering cross sections are always rare events. That's it's like really important, <laughs> which makes going to higher energy actually more expensive because you need more luminosity. But the other is that it's exactly, so you could say, well, suppose this is a soft interaction. And that was, that was the part that we discussed where we said, how do people justify multiplying probabilities? The probability that this scattered elas elastically with the probability that there be one parton here. And that part means that we, it must be, we can neglect these final state interactions. Actually people, the way that people used to uh, uh, talk about this was in a representation of the cross section. So here we take the amplitude, we square it, and then we say, oh, this is the final state. But in fact, the final state could have been much more complicated than that. The parton model says the final state is given entirely, is given by, uh, by an eraser. Isn't, well, okay. It's right here and I'm not seeing it. Oh, this. It, it won't bite me. Uh, okay, all right. Good boy, good boy, down, down boy, down, down. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, it's already white, so what's a little more chalk? So the, the, the parton model is saying, this is the whole thing. This, was, this went by the name of the handbag diagram. 
And they said, why should you believe that the handbag diagram gives the whole cross-section? Right? And it's going to be in our prescription to sum over the final states. To say that, in fact, and to put it this way, uh, if we look at, at this, we say, oh, well, what about this contribution to the cross-section here? Okay, so here's our portrait again of the process as a cross-section, all right? So now, however, we say, well, here's something that could have happened. And in fact, it must happen. You know, on the way to performing, to getting uh, confined particles, it had to happen. But even if they weren't confined, it could happen. But the statement is that each of these so-called cuts that I'm drawing here is a final state. And when we sum over the sum of these three final states, we'll find that the contributions, not every cut, it's although they're all contributions to the cross-section, they don't all have to be positive. In particular, interference terms can be negative as well as positive. And the practical result is when we sum over these three possibilities, we'll find that they cancel to an approximation which brings us to the correct next to leading order in QCD. Okay, So it's, it's this kind of arrangement which uh, gives us a sense that, that we have more more control. Now, another thing <laughs> as we go off on not what's not a tangent, but with it, what is in fact exactly like the, the essential questions. What about the possibility that two partons got together and, and had a fight over the <laughs> over the photons? So we actually didn't know who scattered and who didn't. Right, it could have been two charged particles, and, the, and they're very close together. The photon interacts with both of them, and they have strong interactions or whatever together. Um, what about these? But these, in fact, are they are in fact included in the theory that is in QCD, not in the parton model. What they're suppressed by the fact that, or by our assumption, that the partons are more or less spread out evenly inside the the proton. And to understand that, in fact, there's a whole series of experiments at the electron ion collider and or at the Jefferson lab today to try to get what's called a transverse momentum distribution, which we will come back to if God willing. Uh, <laughs> by the fourth lecture, we talk a little bit about resummation, in particular, so-called QT resummation. The part uh, the, the transverse momentum distributions are, are have information on how partons are coupled together. And in fact, just, okay, this isn't, there isn't a slide on this, but in, in fact, at the LHC and before it at the Tevatron, there were in fact, uh, there are in, in fact, plenty of experimental evidence that a very small proportion of the events have to, uh, like I'm drawing it like this. It's, it's, these would be, uh, these could be four jet cross sections here, say two annihilations into, into gluons. And what you find are back to back jets that exactly compensate each other in large PT that really had to come from two separate scatterings. They're suppressed, they're way, way down at a level which you can calculate the, the order of magnitude and it's completely consistent with the order of magnitude you would expect if these partons were more or less evenly spread out over, over our, our proton, which remember our portrait of the proton before any of these hard scatterings is flat. So we can talk about spread out in a two-dimensional cross-section frozen, so we can talk about them being, not only having a definite fraction of momentum, but a definite position in, in the proton and unexpected, meaning that the distribution in one proton will match, will match up against the distribution in the other proton. And every once in a while, you can have multiple parton interactions. And in the most sophisticated of the Monte Carlo generators, this is, this is a piece which is, uh, you know, uh, modeled there as well. Yeah. 
you can say that stop doing this and you can see the you mean for these? No, no, they were about here. Oh no, here. If, for example, I this this is definitely not a a factorized cross section in a normal way. Well, yeah, that's right. It it would be. Now you might say, uh, in other words, okay. Um, now, I, I shouldn't say that so, I mean, the way I have it drawn here, it's already what we call a higher twist or a power suppressed because it has two partons in the final state. But however, if we only had one, then in fact, at higher orders, <laughs> no, no, I'm, I take it back. In effect, this one, would not be factorizing in the usual case, but if you worked really hard, you could take this parton here and move it into the hard scattering. And you could you could make this one factorize if this is a large momentum transfer here. It becomes a higher order correction, basically because all these states would be way off shell and it's some of our final states you would need would be here between this interaction and the interaction, the complex conjugate. But if this momentum transfer becomes small, then it doesn't factorize. But what you're asking then is an extremely exclusive question. You're asking about, since this is a small momentum transfer, you say, oh, well, I really need to know what's the likelihood of having some small QT exchanged in the final state? Well, it might be the final state, okay because we don't know exactly where this interaction is. But okay, somewhere in there. That means I have to do sensitive measurements on the final state to get an idea of what's going on. And it's those are choice of measurements, what measurements we group together that determines whether our cross-section will factorize or not. And that's true in deep and elastic scattering. And it's especially true at the, uh, at the Large Hadron Collider. Okay, well, I wanna thank the audience <laughs> for uh, all these really terrific questions. All right, so um, let's go on and see where we can get to next. So we were here, we were still talking about the part-time model. Okay, I'm gonna wrap this, I'm gonna go through the next uh, probably 15 slides pretty quickly unless uh, there are questions about them, in which case that's what we're here for, right? The discussions we had are what we're here for, so we feel good about it. The slides here are secondary. Okay, so what we'll talk about here uh, first is the, uh, okay, the extensions are fragmentation from deep and elastic scattering. The closest thing connected to it is fragmentation. Then from fragmentation, we go to jets, and then we'll double back to drill yet, okay, which will take us for the first time outside of electron proton scattering or electron nucleon scattering to nucleon nucleon scattering. All right, so here, uh, this is the concept of crossing applied to deep and elastic scattering. Uh, so single particle inclusive, which often goes by the name of 1PI, that's not to be confused with single particle irreducible diagrams in quantum perturbative quantum field theory where you can separate the diagram by cutting a single line. Here it's a single particle observed in the final state. So what we imagine, so you recognize this guy? Okay. And notice according to this guy, this is, we may say underneath it, the parton model portrait of what's going on in the unobserved part, the, the, the hadronic scattering part. So here's our, our basic process where we have the, just the assumption of lowest order in quantum electrodynamics, and here's the parton model portrait. So what we do now is we say, well, a proton. Okay, it could have been an antiproton, you know, if we had a few extras, and it uh, could have been antiproton to X. What we do is we, allow, we take this proton and we move it from the initial, or this antiproton for now, move it to the final state as, as as a proton, okay? And then we take this electron and move it to the initial state as a positron. 
So what do we get when we do that? We get this scattering, electron, positron. So we took this one and moved it down to here, okay, where it became here. We took this guy, the proton, moved him over to here. And X is X. X is just all the other stuff that's not observed. But now, see, we're doing something which are, it's, it's just beautiful. We're taking the state that we prepare. The state we prepare in deep and elastic scattering is we have electrons and protons. Stick the protons here and shoot the electrons at them. In electron-positron annihilation, the state we prepare is two beams, one electron and one of positrons, and then occasionally they annihilate. So instead of preparing the proton, we observe the proton in the final state. And we say, suppose we observe the proton and nothing else, okay? What is there, we could ask, and if we're brilliant, like Feynman, we realize there is, some, something we could say in, in the natural extension of our parton model consideration so far about how these protons, their production should be thought of. And we think of it in terms of fragmentation. The basic process in this case is electron positron goes to quark antiquark, and then one of the quark, one of the two, either the quark or the antiquark produces a bunch of hadrons. And among those hadrons will be a proton. Okay, so that's written here as H of P, right? but you know, P could be P for proton or P for momentum. So we'll write this as could be any hadron. So you can do, this is our single particle inclusive with again, the emphasis on inclusive. We sum over everything else and don't ask any questions. But the parton model picture of that is just as in a proton, we can imagine finding a parton if we, if it's moving fast enough where it's flat and frozen, we can find partons in there. Partons produced, new and fresh partons, moving at a, a large velocity will themselves evolve in a universal way into different kinds of hadrons. We can't calculate this part, but we can calculate E E bar to Q Q bar. And then all the unknown function will be, all the unknown information will be in this green circle here. So let's see how we do that. We write down a formula that looks just like the other formula, <laughs> which says this is our hadronic. So it, it really just a hadronic, let's say it's E plus E minus goes to H. Our observed momentum is P. Our total uh, center of mass momentum is Q, that's the momentum of the pair that annihilated and became a virtual photon or at higher energies, a virtual Z. And then we say, we look at just the, the cross section to produce parton A, and then we sum over the partons A. In the simplest picture, it's just quark or antiquark, up or down, so there are quite a, there are four of them. And then what we can gather from that is the actual hadronic cross-section will be this lowest order two to two uh, electroweak cross-section times an unknown function, which we call the fragmentation function, the final state sibling of the parton distribution. So it's a function only of a fraction Z and Z is the fractional momentum of the parent parton that the child hadron acquires. So the if if so here p is usually associated with the hadron so it's h of p so the momentum of the parton in this uh in terms of its uh, fraction uh, momentum is actually larger than the momentum of the hadron that makes sense because it was the parton that decayed so it has to be momentum p over z okay and the in the largest of course, there's a limit then to how small a Z you can get to at a fixed momentum, because as Z gets smaller and smaller, P over Z gets larger and larger, and P over Z, or the energy P naught over Z can't be larger than this center mass energy that you started out with, okay? So, you know, so now you say, well, what is this? Why does this make any sense at all? Well, there's a justification to it, which is similar to the justification of this handbag diagram. The formation of some hadron, let's call it C, here it's H, but let's call it C, from parton A takes some time in the rest frame of, of, of the 
hadron. So again, here's this time dilation thing, okay? You go to the rest, if you could go to the rest frame of the parton, things would be happening in a normal time scale like lambda QCD. But now it's like super boosted. So it takes a while. It's gamma where gamma is, you know, the, the special relativity gamma times one over lambda QCD is the time. And it's much, so that says it's much longer in the center of mass frame of the annihilation. This fragmentation thus decouples from sigma hat, which is E plus E minus annihilates and then decays into a quark. That happens over scale one over Q, which is the, you know, this, okay. Or one over the square root of S, which is much, much shorter. So again, it's this idea that you have quantum mechanical decoherence. So you can talk about the probability of producing a quark pair times the probability that this quark over its lifetime, flickering short time in our way of looking at it. But from the point of view of quarks, lambda QCD, one over lambda QCD is a long time. Okay. And that's the time it takes to produce the hadron. That just happens too far into the future. So this fragmentation picture also has another interesting consequence from a kind of uh, phenomenological point of view. It suggests that the hadrons are aligned according to the parton distributions. And since this is a uh, single particle inclusive, that means that if one of them's aligned, all of them had to be aligned. I mean, if they weren't aligned, this P over Z wouldn't make any sense. So this suggests the concept that goes by the name of jets. Okay. And in fact, this is what happens. So these are just <laughs> high, you know, pictures chosen from deep and elastic scattering. So when Hera went out about 10 years after, more than 10 years after in, in the 90s, 15 years after the original, uh, was it 15? Well, anyway, a bunch. <laughs> of years uh, after the original scaling, you had a colliding beam of electrons and protons, somewhat, of course, asymmetric because of the different ways of accelerating them, but you could really see a spray of particles on a regular basis associated with a scattered quark. That's this guy right here. In this total cross-section, we don't ask what happens, but when we look at what happens, we find out, of course, instead of a single line, there's a spray of hadrons, a jet of hadrons. Okay. So here's a jet in deep and elastic scattering. Here we are in E plus E minus annihilation, which was the picture we just saw for the crossing, and where the quark and antiquark went, which was which you couldn't tell here, uh, just on this basis, you have sprays of particles. And these you know, histograms show different kinds of energy deposits associated with those particles. And here from the Tevatrons, now this is like now an archaic event at what is now just moderate energy transfer at the LHC, but you see back-to-back -back jets in extremely uh, 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 powerful way. So we'll again try to, we, we'll see, but if I, I have to get there. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, so that's fragmentation, right? Which is the sort of, uh, sibling of deep and elastic scattering, uh, deep and elastic scattering. Uh, massive massive hadrons. Well, it's going to be you. This picture, the parton model picture, assumes that the masses are small enough to be neglected. Now, how? Suppose they're not or suppose you would just like to get to the precision where they're not. Then there are systematic ways of, of, of approaching that, but generally speaking, corrections to this due to masses will be of the form M squared over Q squared, where Q is the momentum scale of a heavy, of the strong process, be it annihilation or deep and elastic scattering. So by the higher order analysis that, <laughs> I hope we'll talk about. Um, it turns out to be not so complicated. Uh, <laughs> you really have a way of approaching it to say that, in fact, we expect these corrections to be m squared over q squared. Now, in fact, when m is really big, like in the t, t bar cross sections, things like that, then you have a different 
approach to these things because the T, that say the top quark by itself is already a hard scattering process. And so you don't necessarily treat it from the jet point of view unless you're at ultra high energies. And if you hear about boosted jets and things like that, that's the ultra high energies where even at the FCC or something, a top quark could be treated for many purposes as massless. So, you know, you just, you just basically the thing is you wait until you get enough energy. But, <laughs> but until then you have hard work to do, which people have, have, have worked hard to do. Yes. Uh huh. Well, for example, in deep inelastic scattering, when people see charm particles at high transverse momentum in the final state, there the overwhelming probability, whether it be a parton picture or a more sophisticated uh, uh, factorized QCD, is that it came from a strange quark which uh, got a W plus. So the you can do calculations knowing with basic knowledge of parton distributions you know, even just the order of magnitude and, and things like that. By looking at the flavor of particles at high PT in the final state, you can conclude with that the, let us say the overwhelming contribution to that total cross-section is due to a W exchange, okay? And, and like any quantum mechanical, uh, any statement about a final state in quantum field theory, it's always, this is the overwhelming contribution. And you say, well, how do you know what the rest was? You can calculate corrections to it, or you can estimate them depending upon the inputs that you have available, and you know, the level of precision of your parton distributions and so forth. Okay. All right. Finally, the Drillian process. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, an hour and a half is like getting short. So well, time goes fast when you're having fun. Okay, so finally, the Drellian process, partons and hadron, hadron scattering. So here was this amazing idea of Drellian that again, taking the absolute saying, we don't know what partons are, except they, they scatter off electrons and stuff like that, but it must be quantum field theory. So if we had, if the partons were like the quarks, they wouldn't just be the quarks. They'd also be quark pairs produced by gluons in, in quotation marks, which was what they were at the, at the time. So they said, well, if that's the case, then there could, if you collide a proton with an anti, with a regular proton, two normal protons, there are antiparticles to, uh, antipartons to annihilate with partons in the collision. And in doing so, they would produce a virtual photon. And the virtual photon would decay, well, it could decay, you know, quantum mechanics, is extremely ungrateful. You know, a quark and an antiquark sacrifice themselves to produce a photon. And what does the photon do? It's like, you know, it, it decays into anything that has charge. <laughs> you know, all my children are equal. I give them all an equal share <laughs> in my probability, you know, say, but we're the ones who did the work. I have to treat you all the same because it's quantum mechanics. And that's, you know, that's, Life isn't fair. <laughs> so anyway, and so in that way you could produce muons. And back at the back in the day when people didn't have such high energy and all that and everything, muons are really from then till now, they're really, really easy to measure because electrons lose energy really fast. Muons have a way of scooting through and giving you enough information so that you know they're there. So what you do is you say, okay, we have the cross-section for NN, notice it's not NN bar, it's NN, very important, goes to mu mu bar plus inclusive, anything. We don't ask any other questions. 
that should be the born cross section for the annihilation of partons A and A bar into mu and mu bar times the probability to find parton A of C1 in N times the probability to find antiparton A bar, same A, at C2 in the other N. And of course, you switch the two ends because the antiquark is the same. And the idea is that these probabilities here, which we'll call phi of Q over N or A over N, how we would say it, psi I, are the same as in deep and elastic scattering. And that was the idea that Drell and Yan had. The fact that it's the same in deep and elastic scattering is now understood because of work by people like Pollitzer and so forth and getting the thing started is understood as, a, as what we call factorization now. And you can say, okay, to, to anticipate and because who knows what will happen, we may not have time for everything. What's going on? Remember, it was that flat frozen and yeah, flat and frozen business. Two protons coming together. They're partons and antipartons. Now you'd think if they're coming together slowly, this would actually happen. Coming together slowly, the partons over here say, ooh, there are antipartons coming. We've had a lot of fun with the antipartons in our proton, but hey, you know. So they start to attract partons and antipartons, and from this side, the partons and antipartons. That would not happen in deep and elastic scattering. So if they were coming together slowly, the parton distribution picture that you have for deep and elastic scattering would fail because the protons distributions would influence each other by exchanging momentum. That's what, you know, attraction, repulsion, so forth. And the antipartons are all trying to get away from each other, you know, so, so it's, it's complicated, but they wouldn't be the same. That would be what was called a factorization breaking. But if you're really approaching the speed of light, then this can't happen because you can't exchange information and energy to redistribute the, the partons within each of the protons until they come together in a collision which is localized on the scale of one over Q, where Q is, say, the mass of the muon pair. So that's the basic physical reason for thinking this might be possible. Okay. Uh, so the next few slides are a little bit of the technicalities of this, which is very, very much analogous for what we did for deep and elastic scattering. Because it's partons, this is Q and Q bar, and this is, say, electron or electron, positron, something like that. All you have to do is cross it, take the positron here, make it an electron in the initial state, the antiquark here, make it a quark in the initial state, and you have quark electron scattering. So it's basically with relabeling of momentum variables, it's the same process. And as with the other, you can write this down at lowest order in a rather straightforward way. When you do it, you square it, you go through some average, you get this beautiful cross section, which happens a lot. You see four pi alpha squared, that's alpha electromagnetic over nine Q squared of that nine, three is due to the fact that the you can't annihilate unless you have the equal colors, which is really an interesting, it's a big, big effect, one over three, which is one of the underlying physical evidence for color as a quantum number, okay? So, I mean, however, it's more complicated than that, especially for Drellian, because the NLO corrections are already large. They multiply by a factor of two, but this divides by a factor of three, and you, you it wouldn't work without it. Okay, and you can you could say, oh, this pair mu mu bar, I could I know what its invariant mass is, but I could also get its rapidity, which is its plus momentum over its minus momentum, here in terms of the zero and three components, uh, by the by the momentum in, of the two partons, because one would all be in the plus direction and one all in the minus direction then the rapidity being defined where along the uh, the axes of the collision uh, defines the three direction. Okay, and so the size are over determined, that is there are delta functions in the Born cross section. So you integrate over these momentum fractions, but by fixing the invariant mass at lowest order and the rapidity at lowest order, you actually can do the integrals and that's what gives uh, the nice formula above, integrating over rapidity, you go back to this form, 
And uh, that's the cross section. So this was found by Drellian in 1970, aside from the one over three, because they weren't doing it in, a, in a QCD. They were just doing it in, in a, a model theory. It's the analog of DIS uh, uh, scaling. So in other words, the fact that deep and elastic scattering, the structure functions, you can define structure functions here as well. But the cross section basically is only a function of X, except for an overall factor of one over Q to the fourth. And uh, so the uh, X in Drell, uh, in Drell Yen is uh, dependence only on this, this ratio of Q squared over S. So this is the template for all hard inclusive hadron-hadron scatterings. And its motivation or its justification in terms of saying there are universal distributions that describe this is more or less what we said. It's all in that flat and frozen picture for the for hadrons colliding at high energies. Okay. All right. Well, we finally got to section two. <laughs> okay. And so here again, I, um, let's see, we have 50 minutes, uh, no, 40 minutes, okay, 40 minutes less left. I hope to do something on the board for you, at least to uh, uh, an actual field theory type of thing. So um, let's see how much of this we can do. Now, I know you've all seen this before, so at least the first two parts, I hope to summarize as we go through, but please, don't let me get away with it, you know? <laughs> okay, what are we on 42? Well, I'm hoping to get to about 55, so. Okay, so this is just uh, how, where did QCD come from at QCD? Oh, there are a couple of things. One of the things that was beautiful and connected to DIS was very early on, within the first few years, people could say, you know, from the evidence we have in deep and elastic scattering, we don't know this phi of Q, the phi of X's for different quarks that well, but we know it pretty well. And we could get an estimate of the integral zero to one dx of X times phi. Now in the parton model, X is the momentum fraction. So what you're seeing when you do this is in fact the total fraction of momentum carried by quarks. If quarks were all there was, these integrals should, this integral should be one when you summed over all of them, but they're not one. In fact, it turns out to be about a half. So then the question is, this is this is like, this was a really serious in a way that the, well, like the spin crisis that I referred to that happened later, this was like a momentum crisis. But people felt, no, that makes sense that these integrals over five don't give one. And they threw in the anti quarks for this too. There should be something else in the proton. What should it be? It should be the stuff that holds the quarks together. So it should be, as we would say, the gluons, okay? So what are they? And that was the question people could ask in this language. And then there was the concept of these gluons having color. Where did that come from? Well, here's, I, I hope you've seen this before, the fact that, that in the quark model, you expect to make a proton out of three quarks and, and like ex resonances, like the delta resonances should be out of three quarks. And so if they're fermions, it should all be anti-symmetric. But in fact, what you find in the quark model is that it shouldn't work that way actually, because you expect to have the symmetric uh, to get in particular the, the resonances, the delta resonances, you need a symmetric spin. And then you expect symmetric spatial wave function for your quarks because if every time you have an anti-symmetric wave function, you have to have a zero, which means that your function changes more, which means you have more kinetic energy. So you expect in general to have a function without zeros to describe a symmetric function, to describe your, your spatial wave function. So the spin is, and, and the space is symmetric, what else is there? Okay, and, and oh, then you look and you see also that the flavor U and D, that had to be symmetric too. There must be another quantum number. Well, that's what you say if you're Han and Nambu or you're Greenberg looking at it from different points of view. And they said, oh, there's another thing. And it, it, should, it should have an N equal three, a new quantum number, blue, green, and red. And it should be anti-symmetric in that. And that's what makes the darn thing anti-symmetric. There's just another quantum number to, uh, to, uh, to make it work. Okay, and it, it, it had to be N equal three because there's three quarks. So SU3 is like given to you when you start thinking about it that way. 
Now, is it a gauge theory? Well, uh, gauge theory says you could make now color currents to which you could cop, uh, couple color vector particles and those vector particles are gluons. And like we had that picture of the U quark going to the D quark with the W plus, well, a blue, uh, I don't know, a blue quark can go to a green quark by emitting a G blue green or something like that, some vector like this. But here, there's no North Star to tell us the difference between the B and the G. So actually, we have a description, which is an over description, because we can never tell the difference between different colors in this theory. So the, actually, that's where the, in case you're interested historically, that's where the idea of uh, non-abelian gauge theories came from. Suppose you had three quarks and they were absolutely indistinguishable from each other. They had the same masses and everything. The way Yang and Mills thought about it was that's a little bit like the phase of a wave function. The phase of the wave function is real, but we can't observe it in an absolute sense. We can observe differences okay, when we do things. So it, they thought of it as being like some profound ambiguity built into nature. <laughs> Okay, and in fact, lots of people have re-recognized that fact that the non-abelian nature of, of color is like the phase of the wave function. So it's not really a symmetry, it's a redundancy in our description of nature. And that's what makes possible these things you've heard about, instantons, all kinds of solutions, things like that, non-trivial vacuums. But luckily for us in perturbation theory, we don't have to worry about it. We just can't tell what the color is, and that's that. So, okay. And QCD is the theory with n equal three of quarks coupled to gluons, as we all know. Any whatabouts? Okay. So uh, here again, um, this is like <laughs> the field theory stuff, but okay, that's Lagrangian. So. Everybody's seen this Lagrangian. I'm just kind of sort of assume that, and we won't get into stuff like ghosts unless you insist. Um, yeah, so there's QCD. This is the general feeling fields and symmetries suggest Lagrangians, unless you're a bootstrap person, in which case fields, observables, and symmetries are all you have, and you simply use the bootstrap to avoid all this nonsense and go right to the S matrix. You just have to figure out how to do it. But for us, you know, mild mannered people, we like to have a Lagrangian, like the QCD Lagrangian, already complicated enough. Gives us perturbation theory rules. From that, we get Green's functions. We have to renormalize them. And somehow or other, we get from these renormalized Green functions to the S matrix. We invoke LSZ reduction or something like that. And that gives us cross sections and way down here at the bottom are observables. Okay, uh, the next few slides, I'm honestly, you recognize this? What theory is this? Phi fourth, thank you. <laughs> okay, so it's just, uh, we had some examples here in Phi to the fourth and what we do. Okay, so here's something which is kind of interesting and which we're gonna come back to uh, in the following two lectures in a kind of serious way. In fact, we may come back to it now. Um, Maybe I'll just work on this now after a few comments on what comes after. This is a Feynman diagram. Before there were Feynman diagrams, there was, and actually before that, there weren't really diagrams, but there were diagrams that existed, although people didn't normally write them down that way, called time-ordered diagrams. Sometimes this is referred to as old-fashioned perturbation theory. And so what Feynman did that was so great was he said, you know, you can write down one diagram and it represents a number of time ordering. So in particular, if you have two vertices like this, you can have two ways of ordering them. These came after or these came in between. The Feynman Stuckelberg propagator takes all this into account automatically. However, uh, in this, if you insist upon going through these Feynman diagrams, you get this interpretation, the integral over the four momentum. Uh, so you can recognize this, if this is P1 plus P2, uh, this is the standard scalar self-energy diagram. 
or in this case, a correction to two to two scattering. It can be written as a sum over states, which is an integral over this equivalent to the th three components of this integral over loop momenta of the incoming energy, P1 plus P2, or e E1 plus E2, minus the energy of state one, which is the on-shell energies of these two particles. For the other time ordering, there's another time ordering in which the incoming energy is the same, but the energy of the state is the original two particles plus the energy three and four in addition to the virtual particles. And so we have another term that looks like this. And to some extent, uh, okay, there's a couple of things here. This, this example illustrates the role of, of, uh, perturbation, of time order perturbation theory. And here in the context of renormalization, all right, why do we have to renormalize? I mean, why, where do these infinities come from anyway? You know, forget about IR divergences. What about ultraviolet divergences? When you write things in this form, in terms of energy deficits, the original energy minus the energy of the virtual state, then you see it comes from the fact, not because anything happens to the denominators. When Okay, they could vanish, but we, we'll deal with that later. They're normally just totally finite, but there's so many high energy states, okay? That's the thing. There's too many high energy states in all of our four dimensional theories with a few you know, exotic exceptions like the ones that, that Lance is gonna talk about. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, so it's the sum over states that gives the infinities. And then you could ask yourself, how do we get away with renormalizing? This is, what does that make any sense? Even effective theories, we can always add counter terms until we're blue in the face. Why, why can we do that? See, the thing about renormalization is you're adding a contribution, which is like infinite or goes infinite once you take the regularization away, but it's times a local operator. Why are these operators local? They're operators because the high energy states produce energy deficits that are vanishing as one over the energy. When E1 becomes larger and larger, the EN doesn't matter anymore. And that's why the divergences turn into local objects because they live for infinitesimal amounts of time. And in fact, because they don't, everything is violated, including spatial momenta, they, they exist over only tiny portions of space. They're highly, highly localized. And that's in quantum field theory why we can renormalize the way we do, by adding counter terms. It's all there in this so-called old-fashioned perturbation theory. Now I have a question. <laughs> Who has seen old-fashioned perturbation theory derived? Lance? <laughs> well, I thought so. <laughs> yeah, okay. So why don't we do it? <laughs> all right, oh, except, uh, yeah. Let me show you how you do it, because it, it's actually rather simple. Although you can do it, as a matter of fact, the most straightforward way of doing it is solving the Schrodinger equation for an n particle state and asking how it turns into other states. So you start with two particles and then you would start adding other states. And you will find that by sh solving the Schrodinger equation, you can generate exactly this set of terms. Oh, oh, it does this like automatically. Okay. Um, all right. Where's the rest of the white chalk? <laughs> uh, okay, well, we'll let's take some other chalk. Um, my only problem is, of course, I didn't bring the notes. <laughs> so I'll, I'll wing it, okay? And that'll make it, well, we'll see. All right, so we'll start out with an amplitude, absolutely arbitrary amplitude, which is a function of some external particles, Pj. And we'll have all of the particles coming in. P1, Pj, and in our notation, the momentum will all be flowing in. So that means for an outgoing particle, the negative. These particles don't have to be on shell or anything like that. Okay, so we, we have this. 
And we could say this is uh, in an arbitrary theory. Uh, well, this A will be, say, we'll take a single graph. So here we're going to start from Feynman perturbation theory and derive this time ordered form. Okay, so we may not go the whole way, but I think we'll get to the point where you see how it comes about. And so what do we have? We have a product over loops, which we could raise by A, D4 L A divided by two pi to the fourth. I'll keep track of the two pi's a little bit because it'll just help, okay? And then we'll have a product over lines, I, and uh, the lines here would have, each line has a factor I divided by, uh, I think the way I'd like to do it is KI, and I'll write this as a function of P and L. So you see the lines are functions of the external momenta and the, what kind of momenta are the Ls? The loop. I didn't have to use the alphabet. Thank you. You know, this, okay. Squared. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm getting so excited. I'm breaking the chalk. <laughs> Minus MI squared plus I epsilon. Okay. This I epsilon, I could write here. I'm in Europe. I should have written plus I zero, but what can I do? Uh, so we have loops and lines. Now we could do the whole thing with loops and lines, but let me just point out that in general, associated with the vertices, there's a minus i for every vertex. Now it gets a little bit more complicated when there are momenta floating around, but you know, the three gluon vertices don't have a minus i, but it's hidden away there. Times a numerator factor, ooh, which is itself a function of the ki's and the pj's. And just to be really clear about what I mean, like an example, we could have, for example, a self energy, just like the one there, except without the P1, and the P2. Say this is line, this external line Q, well, I'll call it external line P. And then we have momentum K flowing this way and then flowing this way Q minus K. So, the, oh no, this is not in my notation here. We're using L for loops. This is L going this way. So one line is just the loop momentum. The other is Q minus L, like that. No, yeah, is it? <laughs> you, thank you, P minus L. Good, okay, I'm trying to be somewhat straightforward about this. All right, so you see what happens is you happen to have like an I, notice how, you know, oh, and there's one other thing to make this thing really work, we have to use the fact that the transfer matrix has an I factored out of it. S equals one plus I times the T matrix. So that means we should multiply the whole thing times I. And then when you think about it a little bit, you have a, a, um, an I for every vertex, you have an I for every line. And when you do the integrals, you get an I for every loop. And then when you use Euler's identity, you find you need one more I to get something real. So we have something like this, okay? So now what are we gonna do? Oh, except there's one more thing I wanted to multiply by. I wanna multiply this by the energy conservation delta function, delta of the sum of the pj's. And in this case, just the pj zeros. We're not gonna do anything with the loop momentum, in fact. Right. So now, um, what are we gonna do? Now, I, I hope I remember <laughs> since I didn't bring my notes. All right, so what we're gonna do is, so the first thing we do is we take our integral d4 L, L A, each one divided by two pi to the fourth. And we write it as an integral d cubed L A divided by two pi times an integral d L A naught. So I'll put an arrow over the d cube to say, well, we're doing this in terms of the time integral. And the LA naught is also divided by two pi. All right. 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, no, now <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to use the fact that to get to these KIs, what we did was we had a integral. So we take two pi times delta of the sum of the pj's, pj noughts. And then we have a product over a, and let me say the product is a equal one to n. Okay, where n is the number of lines. So n is the number of line, uh, uh, one to l. l is the number of loops, i equal one to n, n is the number of lines, v is the number of vertices, like that. And now, so we have here a product a equal one to L, the integral d L a naught divided by two pi. So we are integrating over all these energies. And what we're going to do is we're going to turn these integrals over all the energies of each loop into an integral over the energies of every line independently. We'll do that at the cost of introducing a delta function at every vertex, okay? And so the way we do this, let me just write this down and we'll see, hopefully I can motivate for you why it's more or less true. Ha, huh. okay. It's a product, an integral over I again, now equal one to N. This is going to be the integral over the K I noughts, all right? Okay. And in fact, we're going to have a two pi for every ki naught. Now, of course, the number of lines has to be greater than the number of loops, or by at least one, <laughs> but usually it's a lot greater. So we put a bunch of extra two pi's in there. But now, notice by the way, this delta function is about to disappear and be replaced by a product over a delta function, which will, let's see, we used A here, we used I there. Let me use C equals one to V, two pi delta of the sum. Uh, now I'm going to, I'm just going to say a sum over I prime of something the letter I haven't used yet, Q I prime naught, where I prime is an element of, let me just say, it's an element either of the momentum of every line, N, or of the external vertices. Well, no, I mean, oh yes, I keep forgetting. The, all right, the sum now is over q i naught, which is an element, and I, I have to take this away because I haven't finished this. It's an element of the set of the, the external lines pj and the internal uh, lines ki. And I did call this q i prime, so it's, an element of each of the of the sets of all the external lines and all the internal line momenta. Now, of course, we're not just summing up all these momenta. The sum of all the external ones is zero anyway, so that doesn't really help us. But what we're doing is we're doing one for every vertex. So what we want is that momentum is, energy is conserved by this delta function at every vertex. So how do we do that? We multiply by a number and we'll call this eta and we'll give it an, an upper superscript C to indicate which vertex it's on and a lower I prime, okay? So it looks a little bit, it's a little bit complicated, but 
not too complicated, I think. So this, so eta C of I prime is equal to one if, well, let me write this as eta J say, so J is for the external momentum. So A to J C is one if P J flows into vertex C. Okay, so that takes care of the part where the Q I prime is an external momentum. For the internal momentum, A to I C, equals plus one or minus one, or I'll put in parentheses minus one, if line QI flows, or, or I say line, but it will say if energy QI flows in, into, or out of, into, or out of vertex C. Okay, so it sort of sounds complicated, but let's go to our friend here and, and say in star, now, will this automatically do this? Oh my gosh, it's magic. <laughs> All right, so this is just what we're doing with the, with the loop energy integrals. We're turning them into line energy integrals. And so in our example, so our EG and star, which is this thing, with P coming in here, we had L, going this way and L, or whoops, uh, P minus L going this way. This corresponds to two pi. If we call this P, and then we say going in here is P prime. Well, P prime has to be minus P, right? <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. So two pi delta of P naught plus P prime naught. And then we had the integral D L naught over two pi, right? From minus infinity to infinity, okay? So that's our integral. And so now what are we gonna do? We're gonna turn this into an integral, not over one loop, but over how many lines? say it so that we'll keep the blood flowing. How many lines, line integrals are there for this diagram? Bless you. How, how many lines? There's L, but there's also P minus L. So this gives us a letter beginning with T. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Oh, you're not going to say it? Please? Pretty please? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to get a form here. Instead of one delta function, one integral, we're going to get two delta functions and two integrals. And it equals then <laughs> uh, two, uh, two delta functions and two integrals. So it equals the product we still have a two pi, uh, the product, no, I'm sorry. I, well, uh, let me just get the delta functions right. The, so the integral is dl naught. So what we're gonna, <laughs> we have to define this as um, some line integrals. So we're gonna say k1 equals l and p, no, yeah. k2, equals P minus L, okay? So what we have then is the integral, the, L, the integral of the L naught is the integral of K1. It's just relabeling it. 
And then the other integral we have is dk2. And then we have two delta functions. One of them is delta. So in, in this vertex, we have p coming in, k1 and k2 going out. So P1 or P, it's not P1, but P gets a plus because it's coming in minus K1 minus K2. That's this vertex, okay? So this is C equal one. Here's C equal two. And we get delta of flowing in our K1 plus K2 and flowing in also is p prime, okay? So I can easily do the k2 integral, for example, I says it equals to p minus k1, but k1 was L, and so I get the integral e for L, and then when k1 plus k2 equal p, that means that this delta function becomes delta p plus p prime, which was the overall delta function. Okay, ah, well, excuse my, so uh, we still have the two pi, uh, well, actually what we really end up here with this two pi squared. We get a two pi for every uh, vertex, okay? And in fact, I should have written this as, uh, all right, my two pies may or may not be totally perfect there, but we're close enough. So let's just try to get to the next point here and, and we'll soon be in the position where we can do the whole thing. So that was the first thing we did or the second thing we did. Right? And now what we're going to do, so here's the strategy from now on. Well, maybe it would be better to write the whole thing down in this current form. A of pj is now equal to, okay, two pi to some number. All right, so we'll, we'll worry about it. The two pi's work out perfectly when you do it right, okay. And so we get the product over loops A equal one to N. We still have the integral dLA vector divided by two pi cubed. Okay, that's sitting out there. But now what we have are a, um, a product, instead of having a, a product over, the same product over loops for the energies, we have a product over lines, I equal one to N. And for every line, we have an integral dL, and the thing I'm using here is ki, ki naught. Uh, and I'm not gonna use the two pi's here, okay? They, they come out into some overall factor here. But you notice that for every line, we already had a factor, which was the propagator. And so now we have ki naught, as an independent integration variable minus ki vector, and ki vector is a function of the external p's, pj's, and the internal uh, la's minus mi squared plus i zero. How's that? <laughs> See, now I've been in Europe for a few extra minutes. Okay, so we now have an integral over every energy. And I wanna emphasize this is an integral from minus infinity to infinity. But we have to now put in our delta functions, just keeping the track of them. That's a product, so this is times C equal one to V delta of, in this case, the sum over the Q naught I's which are both internal and external. And then this matrix, eta ci, well, we're making it i prime just for consistency, 
times the Q, whoops, Q I prime naught, where this goes over both the internal decays and the external decays. And then finally, we have a numerator factor, which is minus I to the V, and then numerator, which is still a function of the Ks and the Ps, Ki's and the Pj's. So the Ki noughts are now independent and so forth. And so now, okay, this is essentially all we'll really have time to do is we write each of these, okay? We expand these or we represent these these delta functions in integral form. Okay. In other words, and what that does for us is that introduces time variables. So again, to Uh, so this, let me just now outline the strategy. So step one is for each C, so each vertex, we have a delta function of this sum, call it A to C I prime, I prime, Q, I prime, naught. We write this as the integral. D, we'll just call it tau C from minus infinity to infinity. Okay, so we, we would need a two pi here, right? I mean, and again, in fact, I think what happens when you have the two pi's, well, the two pi's go away. <laughs> e to the minus i and the sum of the eta c i prime. Well, in fact, let's expand it. We'll sum first over i from one to n. This would be k i naught plus the sum uh, j over all the external j's p j naught. And this is times, okay, what would this be times just to keep us in the last 10 minutes? Yeah, Tossi, thank you, good. Again, thank you for humoring me, okay? So this is the first thing. The first thing is we take, so this is the first, we expand these as integrals over time. And then we'd say, well, oh, so these momenta are now appearing in the exponent, the line moment, okay? And so the second thing is we now recognize that all Ki naught integrals are of the form the integral from minus infinity to infinity, the ki naught, there's an overall i, very useful, an exponent, and this would be e to the minus i, we'll call this tall uh, i, plus minus tau i minus times k i naught divided by k i naught squared minus k i vector squared. I won't put the argument, but this again depends still on loop and external three momenta minus m i squared plus i epsilon. Okay, can we do this integral? Yes, right, we can do this. Well, we kind of know how, because we took quantum field theory and we just use Cauchy's theorem closed in the lower and upper half plane. So 
we do this integral. <laughs> And what we get, we get an I, <laughs> and uh, what we can really get, I mean, I'm going to do it this way. We get a one over, we get a minus two pi I just because we close on a pole. And um, I'm gonna write this as one divided by two omega I. These twos don't really cancel. Two pi's cancel with other two pi's. The two omega i. So what's omega i? It's the the energy, right? I mean the on shell energy, right? So omega i will equal the square root of k i squared plus m i squared, and we're going to get e to the minus i. Total plus i minus total minus i omega i. And in fact, what we really get here is, ah, okay. Where omega i is defined to flow from the vertex with time to minus to the one with time to plus. Okay, there's a little bit of fancy footwork in there because depending upon the sign of tall plus minus tall minus, it's just here arbitrary. But uh, you you would close in the, either the, the lower half plane to get a positive energy, or the upper half plane to get a negative energy. Well, what happens is if you have a negative energy, you just, the times turn around. So they take this form where this is truly the upper, the, the correct, uh, the, the, the time with the larger energy. So we see then we are sort of making sense out of all this. Oh, but what did I leave out of this? Oh, I can't believe I did this. I hate to bring your attention back here, but um, oh no, this one's okay, right? Yeah, so now we need to write down the amplitude finally for the last time, and then I'll write the final result. So our amplitude as a function of all the PJs, is equal to uh, this prefactor to pi to the number, uh, the integral over all the spatial loop momenta, Ka, d3 Ka divided by two pi cubed. And now we have a product over every line, i equal one to n, for each line, we have an integral over its particular, uh, oh, no, 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 <laughs> no, this, all right. I wrote here, this is ki, this is still the product i equal one to n of lines. But the product I wanna write down now is the product over vertices. Because every vertex has a time integral. an integral d tau c from minus infinity to infinity. And that multiplies a product for every line i equal one to n. And the lines now that we have are, uh, each of these lines has a factor of, um, yeah, okay. Let me put a two pi down here because that's what we had. <laughs> and so we have a two pi here. So the two pi's cancel, okay? So here, it just makes the counting a little bit simpler. Um, we get a minus i, well, we have an integral here. And for every line, 
the line is now represented by this I tau I plus minus tau I minus times omega I. And in fact, I, I do have to apologize. This omega I has in it omega I minus I zero, because that's where the pole is. The pole is either at omega I minus I zero or minus omega I plus I zero. And when you make this the, the time where the, the positive energy flows in, that's always the larger time because of that difference. And so this is always the positive energy. So here we have omega I minus I zero. Okay. And basically that's it. Uh, we have minus I to the number of vertices times the numerator factor, whatever it may be. And notice the numerator factor is never more than linear in any given energy of a line energy in any of the theories that we work with. And so there's really no problem in doing these integrals by Cauchy's theorem. So having a propagate a QED or Yang-Mills theory, everything is okay. And so now finally part three, the last thing we do is we do the time integrals for every uh, we do the time integrals for every ordering for every one of the v factorial orderings and this gives what's called time ordered perturbation theory okay and in the case of our example here this, there are only two orderings, okay? If you go to higher orders, you get a fair number of graphs. In fact, there are ways of combining different graphs to give uh, you know, a simpler answer, but we don't need to get into that. Um, but you can see what happens is that it will give, oh, yeah, okay. Now, if we're gonna do this as, um, yeah. Okay, so here for each TC, uh, uh, there's another factor here, which is minus I times P, uh, <clears throat> well, the sum over J of eta C J P J naught. So there's a contribution to the phase of from incoming momentum and uh, oh times tau c. Okay, so now we can see we can do these intervals, okay? It just takes a little bit of doing, okay? The first, so if you have V integrals because there are V vertices, each of the V minus one integrals give energy, what we're calling energy deficit denominators. And then the last integral Again, in each of these orderings, we do it this way, the last tau integral gives two pi delta of the sum of the pj naughts. So it reimposes momentum conservation for each of these graphs. So um, let me not, I'll, I'll begin the lecture tomorrow morning with 
that general time ordered form, which is simply the sum over states for that form is just the product of the loop integrals. And these E minus E1 and here E minus E1 prime is just the energy that's flowed in before each vertex or by the time you get to each vertex minus all the lines that have been emitted but not yet reabsorbed. Okay, so that will happen. You say, how does, why is that so simple? It's so simple because these eta's are either plus and minus one for each line. So at a certain point, a line is emitted from an internal vertex and it appears in the phase and then eventually it's reabsorbed. So it disappears in the phase. And that happens for each of these states as we go along and here, just this simple way. These two lines are emitted here, absorbed here, or they could have been emitted here and absorbed there. In an arbitrary uh, diagram, it happens the same way. In this way, we can see that an absolutely arbitrary diagram, every loop divergence is associated in the ultraviolet with a sum over states that doesn't converge. And that in fact, this will be a local operator. We're also going to use this form, which I'll write down in a way that summarizes everything I've said at the beginning of, last, of next time. The way we're going to use it is we're going to use it to show how this mysterious cancellation of final states in inclusive processes occurs. So there'll be a little bit of reward for you sitting through this rather technical uh, set of, but extremely simple set of operations, okay? Okay, so we'll call it, I think there's a good place to break for today. Doreen's getting up. And uh, yeah, let's have a little bit of a coffee break anyway before. <laughs> okay, so I'll be around for questions. And...